Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 14, I believe we're on now, of uh, the Experience This Travel Show. I'm Lori Timoney, and um, we are here today to chat about Arrival Berlin as well as ITB. So we're a little bit we're a little bit late in this, but uh, we were doing some traveling after the events. So, uh, so we we but we did want to jump in and 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 talk a little bit about um, about the the two events. So um, let's start by having uh, well, first my co-host introduce themselves, Bruce. Hey everybody, Bruce Rosard here, one of the co-founders of Arrival. Uh, we had an awesome event in Berlin a couple of weeks ago and excited to talk to you all and our special guests about the whole week in Berlin, which included ITB, of course. Yeah, I'm Christian, uh, founder of Magpie. Happy to be here again. You're back again, Christian? Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. And you didn't, you didn't bring any AI uh, toys with you today or anything? Just Well, you don't know if this is still me. I was wondering, yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, so why don't we also have uh, our guest introduce themselves. Alexi, do you want to start? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Alexi Tabrizi, Executive Vice President of Global Sales at Big Bus Tours. Uh, basically means um, I'm responsible for all uh, B2B distribution of uh, Big Bus's global portfolio. Cool. I'm very happy to be here. We're happy to have you. Tina? I am Tina from Alternative Athens. Uh, we design and operate experiences in Athens with the aim of showing travelers the true face of our city. And uh, launched another brand called Back to the Roots, which designs uh, road trips all over Greece. I love that. I was on your website the other day and I was I was looking at that. Sounds fantastic. What percentage of your business is that at this point? I'm just interested to know. Oh, very little. Very oh, little. little. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So we, we, just, we just launched it like 10 days ago. So it's something completely new for us as well very cool good luck with that so um let's start with you tina since since we're chatting um what do you what would you say is your overall impression of let's start with arrival um uh, not not of arrival excuse me but your overall impression of where the experiences industry is right now um, you know, thinking about sort of the economic um, piece of it, um, considering, you know, things like potential recession, war in Ukraine. Um, did you feel like people were upbeat? Um, you know, what, what did you sort of take away from, from your various conversations? I think people were um, optimistic about the year to come. Um, especially uh, operators from Southern Europe, but I think everybody was optimistic. However, conservatively optimistic. I think uh, after the hit we all took with COVID, um, it, it, we always remember. Uh, and so I think that people are a bit cautious. Operators are cautious. Um, they are quite confident about the season, but nobody knows what's coming because uh, as I also said during arrival, I don't see a recession this year for our businesses or for tourism in general, but we should be careful about what's coming because also um, mm, things that happen in one economy have a ripple effect on other economies uh, with a time lapse many times and uh, things are happening in the U.S. right now as well. This yeah, so Tina, I want to dig into that a little bit more. Um, you know, you're coming at us with the whole European perspective where Alexi is mm. global and, you know, people are, they see that there is a potential recession. You're saying really not in our industry. And that's a lot of what we heard at arrival um, in the U.S. 22 was the industry's back overall. There's been some gaps, but mostly it's back at 2019 levels. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. are, so you're saying that there are people that are cautiously optimistic. You found a lot of cautious optimism yeah. overall. So yeah. there's also the continuing challenge of hiring people, uh, which is everywhere in the world. So what are people doing? So they, they're preparing for growth. They know that 23 should be better than 22. They're cautious 
about that growth. They might not have enough staff to take care of that growth. So, you know, what do you see with, with people you talk to? And I saw you talking the whole time with all your, you know, all, all the other operators out there. Uh, you know, what are, how are they dealing with the cautious optimism, but being cautious, but also trying to prepare for growth? I think they are trying to prepare for what's coming for this season. I mean, it's already challenging enough finding the personnel to handle uh, the demand for this season, guides, per staff uh, at the office, et cetera. And um, I think it's it's uh, handling one thing at a time. So I think the approach is let's deal with this season and we'll see what we do for the next season. I think uh, in tourism also you can have early signs, like you can have an idea about your bookings uh, from the winter uh, season as well for what's coming the next season. So how are your bookings? Um, not, how are your bookings looking? They're they're great. They're great. However, uh, we've been monitoring and comparing, you know, the bookings we had in November in comparison to the bookings we had last November for the season. Um, and we saw that there were about 50% up. So November 2022, uh, we were looking at June 23, and we were 50% up in bookings compared to November 21. However, we couldn't interpret this. Did it mean that we are going to have 50% more booking, more, more customers? Or did it mean that people were just planning ahead of time mm. and not last minute That's... like they were doing last year? And I think it's, it's, it's the, um, the, the first option that they are booking ahead of time again, like they're getting back to normal and they feel comfortable booking early on instead of very last minute. But this is something that every operator is facing, more or less. Um, so I, I want to just add one thing here, that Lori, take it back, and, and we can hear from Alexi. You mentioned cautious optimism. Everything you mm. just said, because you're looking at just 23, not forward, sounds like optimism. Not, ca not yeah. like, throw caution to the wind. Be optimistic and just grow, right? Like, No. <laughs> <laughs> no, because... Um, COVID has left scars on all of us in the travel industry. I think when I'm thinking about it, pre-COVID, we were like teenagers because we tourism was booming all over the Western world and we were all uh, very happy and making good. So we were like teenagers and we thought uh, life is forever. And then I think COVID, what it did to us, it, 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 took us from teenagehood to adulthood very, very quickly. Okay. And this is something you don't forget. You don't forget easily. So Alexi, um, how are your bookings looking for Big Bus right now for, for 2022? And then also, how are you dealing with planning for 23? Are you also finding that you're kind of in that adulthood of cautious optimism or are you still kind of like having a party on the top of the bus? Well, I will say, <laughs> excuse me, our recovery has been strong, um, but I will, I, I'll address cautious optimism first because I see it as two things. The, optim the optimism piece is we are very confident the demand continues to grow. Um, and any of the research and studies I've seen about an, a, you know, a possible recession is that our sector will be relatively resilient throughout. We, we've seen studies on the consumer behavior um, and what, you know, a recession would, would mean for consumers that ours looks to be one of the least effective, which is great. And then also keeping in mind that there's still all these airline bottlenecks where they've not returned to full scale operations. So the, the prices are still very high. And so as those continue to decrease as airline you know, um, operations resume to pre-COVID, you know, we'll see it actually getting less expensive to fly in the first place. So on that side, we're very optimistic. I'm personally very optimistic. Where the caution comes in, is the inflationary pressures, supply chain pressures we see, you know, from different events happening 
around the world. Certainly the war in Ukraine um, has a lot of implications across Europe, potentially Brexit. Um, and we have to prepare our business for those cost increases and make pricing decisions based on those cost increases. And, um, and, and that's where it's, it's a balance, right? So it's definitely um, weighing those two things. And I think that defines cautious optimism, at least mm. for big bus. Okay. So getting back to arrival Berlin um, and, and ITB, um, let's shift uh, now to Google things to do. Um, and I'm going to ask Christian, if you think that operators understand the changes that you know Google has recently put in place, um, how are they? Are they utilizing Google things to do to the extent that they should be? What percentage are? Um, it seemed like you got a lot of really positive, or I heard positive feedback on your session at at arrival. What do you think, you know, after connecting with the operators at arrival, where are they sitting with as far as Google things to do and kind of where that's the various, you know, sh shift that Google's had recently? Those those six questions, Laurie. No, no, 5%, yes, no. All right. Walk us okay, through. Walk us through that's it. Fine. Come on. <laughs> no, look. It's been 80, it's been, well, it's been about 20 months now since Google Things To Do came out and it's ever evolving and it will always evolve, right? And it's, and it's expanding, which is great. Um, it's confusing. I, I do, I do demos all the time, workshops all the time. It's confusing because it's, because Google's a confusing product. It's not what it was 10 years ago, where there's just a single search result with 10 links on it. There's stuff all over the place now. Um, so I, it, it is difficult to describe how it works and where your links show up and where they don't show up. But I'll tell you, it's it's 95% OTA links. It's 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 mostly free links right now and the OTAs are, are taking all that money and they're not shouting about it because why would you if they're taking all the money? O operators need to jump on it uh, quickly because it's it's free. It's, it's, it's amazing to me that more operators are not. We, we have some big operators, as you probably know, on, on Magpie and they're, they get a lot of traffic. It's, it's it's a ton of traffic. So let me let me if I could interject here. I'd love to hear from Alexi and Tina what you are or are not doing with Google Things to do, um, and then back to your question, the question that Lori asked you, Christian, from your workshop that you did at Arrival. You know what percentage of those people really kind of were in it and using it, and what percentage were just getting started and really didn't have a clue. So Alexi, are you working on Google things to do? We are not yet. Um, not. Now I'll tell you my 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 personal views is I think Big Bus is the perfect product for it uh, for many reasons. We yeah. have stops around all, the, all the points, of, points interest. of interest yeah. that we can capture that demand. Um, on top of that, a lot of the points of interest are non-ticketed, so there is no ticket only option. So then you know you're just getting even more visibility. And then of course we have combo products. So bus plus Empire State Building. I think um, we, we have connected a few of, a few points of interest thanks to thanks to Christian actually, and are seeing some really nice traffic, but we have not yet done it, you know, full scale uh, globally at Big Bus, but it but it will come. But if I want a big bus hop on hop off tour in New York, I can probably buy it on Google Things to do through one of your OTA partners. I'm sure. Right, and Absolutely. so you're paying them their their commission. Yeah. Um, okay, and and you just haven't had the resources, time, and opportunity to work with a connected partner like a Magpie to avoid that and get your own product listed. Yeah, I think there's a few things. Probably one aspect is it's it's cross functional uh, work at Big Bus. I think partially is what Christian just just touched on that maybe some operators or some. Um, departments within some operators don't fully understand the resources required to manage it and just kind of assessing that. Um, and like Christian said, it is confusing because Google is constantly iterating. So I think just the comfort of being like, okay, we understand it. This is what we're going to do and invest in it. Yeah. Um, and then there's the, the other, the other thing is which, which route do you go? You know, Ventrata is our ticketing system. Do we go through Ventrata to do this? 
this is what it would be like if we went through Ventrata, do we go through, you know, let's say Magpie to do this and, and what would it look like there? So just kind of the decisions yeah. surrounding it are still to be made. Yeah. Bigger it's organizations have a tendency to require longer uh, or a bigger effort when it comes to things like that. Big Bus is a huge enterprise with lots of layers of of uh, decision making has to go on, right? Um, compared to Alternative Athens, where Tina, yeah. <laughs> this is your decision. Um, yeah, exactly. So are, are you working to really make sure you're listed in Google Things to Do? So when I'm in Athens and I want to go just visit the Acropolis, you're going to come up. Yeah. So we adopted it uh, very early on, thanks to Arrival, I should say, because this is where I first came in co into contact with Google Things to Do and what it means, and even though it was at an early stage. So um, in the beginning, we were trying, we we're using a booking software and we were trying to, we were asking them, you know, how do we do it? How do we integrate it? And they weren't making a lot of sense. And then finally this year, we connected our products to our booking software and we couldn't see them on Google Things to Do. And I said, where are they? And they said, uh, we need to talk with Google. And then they came back and they said, we talked with Google and you need to create a campaign. You need to pay and create a campaign so that your products actually show up and say, no, <laughs> this isn't true. This isn't how it's supposed to be. So um, they're still trying to figure out how to use it. So I'm also waiting because uh, Google announced also that it's going to be possible for operators to manage uh, Google Things to do directly through the business account. Um, so we are connected already through our booking software. We are trying to see uh, if we are going to be able to do it directly through our business profile on Google. And then a third option is going to a company like Magpie uh to do it for us but i am personally still waiting to see before i invest in another yet another channel right uh for this but you one thing is for Google, sure right yeah i don't mind speaking out on this the, the rest text have done a terrible terrible job at this google things to do the only listings we see are a little bit of boken a little bit of booking kit Every other res tech is doing a terrible job and they're not serving their clients like they should be. They're just, there's nothing to talk to Google about. Everyone's got the same connectivity. They don't know how it works. They just haven't done a good job of it. You, I just checked your, your site, um, Tina. You're not live on your Google business profile. I'll get that live for you today. Ooh. It takes us about five minutes. One this benefit already. Christian, this tell us about good. your session. Alexi, you, you have spent, to pay for it. You spent 45 <laughs> minutes. Yeah, you can talk about that offline. You spent 45 minutes with a bunch of operators talking about Google things to do. What 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 did you get back? What was the feedback? Did they understand? Are they using it? Like, give us give us your overview. The, the, they are. The, 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 the problem is the, the, the honest truth is that the rest techs have done a terrible job, but it's not great for every product right now. If you've got a boat tour. In, on the on the beach in the middle of Florida, it's not a good product. You're not going to get tons of traffic. If you're in a big city, you will. So the, that's the problem. A lot of operators they they shouldn't be spending a ton of time on it now. It's not getting a ton of traffic. So ten percent probably that that go to the workshop are, are alive. But that's that's obviously there's some bias in there, right? There's the selection bias. People who decide to go to the workshop are probably the ones more interested. I'd say of all operators, it's probably two percent that are that are participating in wow. free traffic. So definitely so spend, more, yeah. more work to be done on that for sure. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so let's let's jump over to AI. Um, you know, obviously there was this incredible session at Arrival Berlin, and if you haven't seen it, you ought to, uh, ought to go to, um, well, I guess you have to join Insider Pro, right, Bruce, to get, the, to get access to the session. But anyway, um, Mark Mecki was amazing. Um, he just gave this incredible presentation that sort of gave a real world view of what, what you can accomplish with AI. So um, let's start with you, Alexi. What did you kind of, what did you come away with when, when you, um, you know, you, obviously the session took place, people were talking about it all over the place. Do you feel like, the experiences space is kind of jumping on this 
or are they kind of a wait and see approach? What are some of the conversations you, you were part of? It seemed that everyone at arrival was talking about that, that keynote. And then the session he did with Christian after. Um, I think because of how he framed it, which I thought was great from the start, was that you don't have to drop everything and change your strategy to figure this out, but also don't ignore it. And these are the things that you can do with this. And I learned, I think I wrote to Bruce, that that was the session of any arrival I've learned the most in. And I will tell you that I have taken a lot of those learnings back to Big Bus. We are going to start using AI for a couple key things now and now know where we have use cases to use it, you know, further. Um, one- Can you tell us? What? Sure, I will, because the first thing which sits in my world, so I'm the decision maker, is using um, AI to generate our content, uh, particularly for trade. So we are gonna use, you know, MapPy to, to help us with that. Um, one of our biggest challenges in, in my team anyway, is how to, you know, we don't have a copywriter in our cities that when they come out with a new product to give us a good description to then load onto all these, you know, different trade platform sites. And my team were okay, but we don't have the knowledge from the city to you know, make it as good as it should be to do it justice on an OTA. So with, with Magpie's solution, we can generate a really, you know, great baseline of content to work with from new products. And, and we constantly do have new products, whether it's combos or, or out of town tours beyond just our hop on hop off that it's incredibly useful for. In addition to that, and Lori, I know with your experience in trade, you know, training certain types of trade partners, non-OTAs is, is very key to, to growing them. So Magpie can help us generate um, with chat GPT, some scripts for training and even, you know, the, the voice itself to then layer onto a video. And we can do that at scale and much more effective than we've been trying to muddle our way through to build ourselves. Yeah, that would so, be very interesting to see when you have that, you know, when you have that settled. Um, I think that's a great idea. Tina, what about you? Um, did you, what do you think about, you know, what's happening in the world of experiences with AI? Are you utilizing it for any reason, thinking about it? What, what, what are you It's at? fascinating. It's fascinating for me. Uh, I am observing with eyes wide open. Um, I think that the obvious choice like for operators is to use it for content. Um, but here, I think we have to be very careful because AI is still at its, uh, at chat GPT is at a very early stage, which means that it has a very specific tone of voice that creates a kind of uniformity in the marketing material. So we have been using it to see like, take this text and make it better, et cetera. But it has, it has um, um, the content it, it, it produces doesn't really have soul. I mean, it doesn't have character. It's a good text, but it doesn't have the character of the text that a very talented writer has. And um, I am quite, concerned about this kind of uniformity that we will be getting in the future in terms of content uh, from chat GPT. Uh, now, I don't know in other things what it could do for other things for us like SEO. Could it do SEO as well? Probably it will be able to, and this will be very uh, practical and important to operators. What I got from um, um, the presentation we saw at arrival was that it will enable small operators that don't have the resources to actually produce a higher quantity, uh, a higher quality content for their whole marketing suite. 
So I think this is important. When I say small, I mean also very small, like a, a standalone guides that have a business or mm. very small companies. Even our, we are not a very big company either, and it can help us in many respects. But I think we should be careful about what kind of tone it creates and if that tone fits the brand. Okay, so Christian, I need to hear from you on this. Yeah, you know, I'm, I get I get excited by this I stuff. Mean, I mean, I um, look at your face and I'm like, he's dying to say something. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let me start on the tone because, and I, I'm not going to do a 10-minute rant on how this stuff was trained and all that, but it can do any tone you want. It can speak in perfect pirate or Shakespeare or excited. The the, the only tone it, get, it has a problem with, if it gets too excited, it starts saying like yippee and yahoo and weird like Americanisms and stuff like that. But you can change the tone and it can do any tone and it can speak any kind of accent and any kind of, if you can define your tone, whatever you tell your writer to do, just tell GPT and it'll, it'll repeat back to you and then just tweak it. Um, so I, I do think there is, a, and there is a lot of hesitation. The biggest hesitation I hear is the hallucination thing, right? Where it makes stuff up. And it does make stuff up where it doesn't have information to go on. I just had a call this morning where we were talking about some products. And if you're talking about San Francisco or big cities, it's not going to make anything up because it's got tons of content to go on. But I think I think it's a it's a deeper there's, there's deeper applications than everyone's using them for right now. And I think it's going to revolutionize it. Alexi mentioned a couple. We we, we built your um, your B two B trainer this morning, Alexi. We just released it. So you can now create a 30 second snippet to send to a travel agent and you can not do whatever absolutely. accent you want or whatever that language you want. That is so cool. I, love I mean, Mark, Mark mentioned in his keynote, don't think about this for long form content like that. That's what a lot of people think about it. Or that's kind of the easy, the low hanging fruit. But there's a lot more it can do. I would love, Christian, just give us like two or three use cases. I mean, you've been playing with this, really thinking more about the middleware that you can build versus what anyone can throw into GPT to get back content, et cetera. Can you just give us real quick two or three use cases you've seen where you are in your head about what's coming next and then we can move on from this topic? I'll give you three quick ones. One, we built a chat box. I can now ask a question of any product in Magpie. So I can say, what time is the tour? How much is it for a kid? And is it suitable for um, kids over 18? And do I need a jacket on the bus? And it, that's all I have to say in that exact tone, and it will answer all of those questions. And you didn't have to program that. Just like today, if I wanted to use some chat bot so people could ask questions about arrival, when's the event, where's the event, blah, 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 um, I'd have to program a tree for the chat bot. You're saying mm -hmm. you don't need to do that? Well, because Magpie's already got the product content, right? So that's how you can query a product. So... If, if Chris gets my um, Slack behind the scenes, he's going to have Tina's products already built out before the end of this podcast. And we'll be able to query <laughs> one of Tina's products with a live question about, does it include the whatever in- Get that things. done. And we can do that. We can share screen and get that done. Come on. I'm not sure if he, I'm not sure if he went for a coffee or not. But... <laughs> Come on, Chris, get that happening. Okay. Chris is also having a baby in two days. So we'll see. But that, that, that's why we built this chat box. Wait, Chris um, is having a baby? Wow, I think it's his wife, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, se second one, and this was another big bus when I was talking to one of the big bus people in, in Berlin, actually, after um, after one of the events. So the audio tour, right, which is which big bus does the audio tour on the buses, and lots of people do audio tours, and those are generally recorded ahead of time and carefully scripted, and that's fine. But you could easily now create those on the fly. Maybe, maybe not your main channel, but you could create an alternative channel you've got multiple channels on the bus where you can choose your languages you could just create one every morning and you could use yesterday's content right so there's an event today at the stadium that we're about to drive past you can say you know what taylor swift is going to be performing here at seven o'clock tonight and the giants won the you know the season opener last night you could put today's content as part of your tour very very easily so things like that just to freshen up an everyday product so it doesn't seem like it was written two years ago and half the stuff's out of date. Um, that's a couple of examples. Another one, um, well, there's, 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 the, there's the B2B training piece. And then 
the, the, the last one I'll give you is I, I've spent most of my career doing hop on, hop off in San Francisco. I just wrote a business plan. If I was starting off, uh, starting a bus tour, doing hop on, hop off in San Francisco, I, I could have written that six months ago. I could have done it. I could have spent six months writing that business plan. I can now produce that in about half an hour. Mm. And it's, it's, it's got everything I know. It's got everything I've ever learned. There's bits and pieces, right? That you, local information. But I've got a marketing plan. I, dr I drilled in, created an Instagram plan, drilled in, create Instagram posts, drill into that, create Instagram image. It, you just drill into this stuff and it can create everything you need. So it's, what it's you just talked about, urban. Christian, is is what is marketable, right? So with all of this, we need somebody to, um, you know, sell. Okay, here's how you do this in ChatGPT. Here's how you do this. Well, here's the prompt you use for this. But so I know that we're, you know, we've we've obviously got a lot. We could spend the whole time on this, and we we probably we have, and we and we will we will again. But um, so there's two other things that I want to talk about. Um, we do have to get on to ITB. We've not discussed that at all. But before we do, um, OTAs. So it's interesting because it seems like a lot of arrivals. I know that I've been to. There's there's kind of this, you know, underlying um constant buzz going on about OTAs and commissions and you know OTAs and operators and they're kind of going at it and I noticed that at the arrival Berlin or at least I thought so that um that there wasn't as much of that it seemed not to be as big of a I don't know if it's because everybody was busy talking about AI and Google things to do or whatever but and maybe people were just so excited about the, you know, how every business is coming back. I do know Douglas had that question on the panel. And again, it was a pretty, not a long conversation. Um, so would love to get your thought on number one, do you feel like people were talking about that? If that was, you know, kind of a conversation that was going on in the background and maybe I just missed it. Or do you think that just somehow we've moved on from that a little bit? And by the way, can I just say, Tina, that I really liked your comment about or your idea that in the future, the smaller niche operators would be working more kind of on the direct side and it would be sort of the, the medium and the larger companies or the enterprise that would be with the OTAs, which makes a lot of sense to me. But it, I don't know, maybe you want to start, Tina, and just talk a little bit about about that well uh to your first question was there a lot of talk about the otas among tour operators i don't think so i have the same feeling like you i think it is we are coming to some kind of peace with it that they are part of our business model and perhaps they are uh swallowing more and more of our business um, it's the thing of, we were saying before, you can't live, live with them, you can't live without them. Now I think we are just at the point where you can't live without them. Uh, and uh, we've made peace with the first part. Um, they are growing very much post-COVID. I think that they are getting a higher and higher percentage of our business. Uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing. What I was I mentioned in the panel discussion is um, the percentage of uh, their business in your business and the balance you have to keep. So um, they are partners to a certain extent, but we should be careful about how much power we're giving them into the business. Yeah. And um, let's, uh, there is another thing that I'm thinking about something we discussed earlier, which is Google things to do. So now we know that when operators are on Google things to do, the official website of the operator appears number one, and then the OTAs appear below that. What if they decide to undercut the price on Google things to do and present a lower price than the official operator, for example? What can you do if you are selling 50 and they are selling 48? What can you do about it? Um, there is a, depend a growing dependence uh, that, and this is the only thing that concerns me. I'm, I'm happy for the business they bring into, 
uh, but small operators, they cannot compete with OTAs in terms of advertising spend and in terms of, uh, you know, the clientele they reach and the clientele they reach on a worldwide level. Because now people, for example, that book through Get Your Guide or Viator, they think that Viator or Get Your Guide is the operator. And, and sometimes they will call you and they will say, I've booked um, a, a food tour with you. And can you please tell me about that yachting tour that I've also booked with you? And we say, yeah, you know, we don't do yacht tours lots, and, or lots whatever. Of, lots of challenges around that still to, to be discussed. Alexi, what about you? What, what are your thoughts on this? You feel like <laughs> we're, we're kind of coming to a place of peace on this or... or is there still a struggle? Obviously, well, you're a little bit of a different place being Big Bus versus Tina's company. Yeah, but I, I do agree with a lot of what Tina said. I will say I definitely felt the focus was much less on OTAs at this arrival. Um, but the session with the panel, I did feel that, that that tension was very much there. Actually, I thought Berlin had more of that tension than in Las Vegas. Um, to the point where I actually raised my hand to um, have a comment and question uh, set in it. But, you know, I think, and what I'll segue the, to is to Tina's point, this this pricing. Um, I mean, I, I think for operators, whether big or small, we have to be diligent in our contracts about ensuring that they cannot, you know, sell at a cheaper price. I mean, some of it's down to us to manage in the extranets. Um, but we don't want web cannibalization either. I mean, even though I represent all B2B and my, my channels are the most expensive channels for big bus, you know, I'm still, you know, big bus driven in the end, and I would never get trade volume at the expense of more profitable, you know, direct web traffic, for instance. So yeah, I agree with Tina that the price is always a watch out. I mean, we, we kind of build uh, build that into our contracts, but of course, sometimes you know you can't you can't you know be on top of everything. Um, your contract means something different to them than Tina's contract does. Yeah, so yeah, but it's still a contract, I, I, and you can you can, can protect just, the pricing. In the yeah, contract. jump in here and tell uh, just to add that pre-COVID we were working with Kluk, and Kluk was selling some of our tours at a lower price than we were. And the, when we realized that, we said, either you stop it or we, with, we withdraw the, the tour. And they did. But can I say that to Viator? Can I say that to Get Your Guide? Well, my experience is that Get Your Guide or Viator don't do that. And this they is don't. my experience. They don't. But right. what so does happen because, let's say, price over API functionality doesn't work with all of the OTAs, if we put on a web discount that we decide to also extend to the OTA because we don't want our conversion rate to suffer, when that web promotion ends and our direct website goes back to full price, mm -hmm. we have to be on them constantly to adjust the price back up. So that is the difficulty. I think once they all get price over, uh, price over API to actually work across the board, a lot of that will, will be alleviated. I want to share screen for a second because I think this is a really interesting chart based on this conversation. You guys can see my screen, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is from uh, the research that we completed uh, October of 22. I mean, look at what has happened from 2019 to what we expect to happen by 2025. Offline channels are going to go down seven percent. Direct. This is direct channels, right? Will grow 82 percent and OTAs will grow 152%. Um, now, of course, this is speculative based on research, but it's really good research and uh, Douglas and the team know what they're doing. So I just wonder, even though everyone wants more direct business, yes, uh, and especially for a company like yours, Tina, that's smaller and doesn't have all the inventory that a big bus has, uh, you know, and you've mentioned you're looking for like a 50-50 split between direct mm -hmm. and distribution. When you see 152% growth through distribution, that, that's not a little number. That's something you really got to think about. Yeah, definitely. So um, we only have about five minutes left and we haven't talked about ITV at all. <laughs> Maybe there's a reason for that. <laughs> so 
I want to start with you, Alexi. Big Bus being a global organization, I would imagine that you probably had a fair number of appointments at ITB. Do you still <laughs> find that ITB is important for your business? Um, if you weren't there, would you not have been able to get those, you know, to meet those people otherwise? What's your what's your feeling on that? Such a great question. I have to think about how I want to diplomatically answer it. Well, who I, said you have to be diplomatic? <laughs> Christian, yeah, we don't need diplomacy. So you know, I will say ITV will not see this see this show. That's okay. true. That's true. Thank, thanks for that reminder. Well, I think ITB was as successful as it was for us because it was off the back of arrival. The, the thing is, there are a couple partners we work with that are OTAs that haven't gotten on the arrival bandwagon yet. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they will one day that just go to ITB. So, yeah, absolutely. It was great to see them in person. But a lot of our meetings at ITB were really another meeting after we already met met those folks at, um, at ITB. Awesome. And the benefit also and you know, shameless plug for you and Douglas, Bruce, why I love Arrival so much is you get the most senior uh, people at all of our partners at Arrival. So, you know, I'm not going to meet um, at WTM, you know, Sarah or Ben from Viator, you know, they don't, they don't attend uh, WTM or IPW and they wouldn't attend ITB if it wasn't for Arrival. Uh, right by it. So, you know, it's a big investment to do ITB, to do any any show with a big booth and all that. So um, it's always one we think about what really is the ROI? What would have, you know, what would have happened had we not been there? Um, I think we'd missed out on a couple meetings. Um, but to me, Arrival has by far the biggest return. Well, that's good to know. And I also, I also wonder myself, something I've always thought about, Alexi, is you know, if I'm at world travel market, like, do I need to be at ITB and world travel market? You know, I feel like there's a lot of overlap there. Um, Tina, what about you? You said you went one day to ITB. Did you feel like it was beneficial? Mm, not really. I wanted to do, I want to see two things. One, I'm always looking for uh, new trends when I uh, go to conferences or uh, exhibitions and stuff like that. Uh, to see what's going on, to be inspired. I didn't get that at all from ITB. It's, uh, it wasn't the first time I visited, but I got the same feeling. It's too hectic. It's too, um, it's just, it's just too much. It's frustrating. Um, and then it's definitely not beneficial for small or medium-sized operators. And then I also want to see if it would be suitable for meetings for our new business back to the roots. And the, 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 uh, the answer was no. So that was beneficial. The, they ruled it out as an option for uh, sales in the next few years. Um, no, I'm not going to visit again personally. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't offer anything. Well, on, on the other hand, Arrival is the place where I actually make decisions for the business. Uh, while I'm, I'm watching, uh, you know, the theater sessions or I participate in workshops, I actually come out with decisions for my company because it's the, the only place where I can sit back and think about my business as a consultant. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't get to do that when I'm, I'm, I'm in the business. So I think, Christian, you sure. and I, for Magpie and Arrival, are going to need to underwrite the cost of this show. Um, and, and put some money in <laughs> where our mouth fits as a sponsor. I think so. I'm all for that, by the <laughs> <Yeah>. way. <laughs> totally, totally <laughs> on, not planned. Why don't you throw out your question um, about the timing? Yeah, I do want to ask that. Thank you for that, Lori. And, and we, anyone who went to Arrival uh, that is watching this is hopefully already has a survey back or, or will be getting our customer survey about the event. So our biggest thing is, as you know, ITB used to be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and arrival was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And they switched to Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday pattern. And that's their pattern. They're not gonna change back. And little old arrival doesn't really have much impact on what ITB decides. So we're trying to make the definitive decision for next year, 2024. Beyond that, we'll see. But for 2024, do we start on a Saturday and go Saturday, Sunday, Monday? So there is no conflict. Or will people not really want to work the whole weekend? And should we stay with Sunday, Monday, Tuesday? 
realizing Tuesday is a conflict for smaller companies like Tina's company. She's been to ITV this year. That might not be an issue for her. For a bigger company like a big bus, uh, it might be more of an issue for you, Alexi. So that, that's a really hard decision for us to make. Um, would love to get your feedback on it. I've already, you, already you heard want French have... people to work on a Sunday. Yeah, I want French people to work on Sunday. They already work on Sunday. Uh, the question is, will they come on Saturday? <laughs> well, I have you know, I have a comment. I, I think I don't know how possible it is. I love I mean, I love the, the venue um, of Arrival Berlin, but the challenge for us at Big Bus was how ITV and the Arrival venue were on complete opposite ends of the city where if there was flexibility on your side to find another venue closer to ITB, I don't think it would be a problem for that. I could nip that in the bud. There is no other venue. Okay. <laughs> the largest hotel, conference hotel in Berlin, the Estrell. Uh, we've gone through a couple smaller ones. Um, yeah. There, well, there is one really fancy intercontinental that's already used for the hotel investment conference. We've looked at all of our options. This is where arrival Got Berlin it. will be. As, well, as long as we're in would... Berlin, that's where we'll be. Got it. Well, then I would say, then I would say start the Saturday because I really was sad to miss out on Tuesday because um, I, no, sorry, I did go Tuesday, but half my team had to miss out. Um, yeah. So, but you are an American um, who is more used to working weekends than the Europeans, right? Mm -hmm. You are a big company who has to be at ITV. So that's one perspective. Tina, yeah. what do you think? Um, I think uh, it depends if you are uh, 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 not attending as an operator or attending as a company. So I, I don't mind coming on a Saturday, but like companies, if you take with locals, for example, that they bring their whole team, uh, they may be hesitant to make their people, their team work the whole weekend. So I, I, on the other hand, you're definitely missing out on people that will go to ITB that maybe wouldn't go. Actually, you are bringing people to ITB that wouldn't be there. And because they're at arrival, they say, oh, there is ITB as well. Let's, let's uh, go there and see what's going on. So I don't think it's a good idea to be coinciding with ITB. Why don't you do a survey, Bruce? We are. Okay, good. Well, we're doing it to everyone who came to Berlin. Um, I might put it on a LinkedIn survey also, but um, the people who came to our arrival Berlin, uh, there should be a survey in their inbox this week. And Good. that's one of the questions for sure. But, really you know, it's going to be 50-50. I can tell you right now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And it's well, going to be split between, you know, a big company that has to be at ITB and a smaller company that spending one day is fine. Uh, and I think the European and, you know, I don't know about the UK market, whether they think more like Americans or more like Europeans in terms of working they're in between <laughs> can i say maybe maybe mm -hmm. the uh the answer is putting more of the small operator geared content on the day that would overlap with itb we did that yeah the theater was all monday right yeah but there was no theater on tuesday so tuesday was much more breakout tactical you know what you're kind of talking about we also yeah. focused on our more attractions oriented content on Monday, channel, you know, channel management. Right, right. That's right. You did do that. So, but it's still a bummer to have 150 people that can't attend. Um, yeah. yeah. It'd be really good if you could do something about the coffee though at the hotel, Bruce. <laughs> that was the worst coffee in the world. Was it really? Yeah, really? It really was. Apart Not from the, the food control, was good though. The food was good. The food the was food good. was amazing. The food was amazing. Right, we are like way over time. All right, we gotta go. We gotta go. <laughs> I just go. want to say, I, I thought the coffee was good, Bruce. I, I want to defend you. I did you. too, I, actually. I never defend you. <laughs> Gosh, you guys are. I'm going to save my moment right. to defend Bruce's coffee. Well, then we'll save that for another second. Wait, all right, so that's a wrap is the coffee. <laughs> that's a wrap. That's a wrap. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Tina and Alexi. Uh, we Appreciate it. We got the we got the wrap up done. So um, not too much time on ITV, but it sounds like there's not a whole lot to say there. So um, I feel. All right. Well, thanks, thanks for, for having me. It was really nice. Thank you, Laurie. Thank, Thank you. you nice to see you. Really appreciate it.